Uh, why don't you and I, I have a couple teams I think just have to make, beyond just putting together a good team, have to send a message to their fan base to say, no, we're going for it too. We're not conceding anything. Um, what, what team would you say needs to really just kill it this offseason? Yeah, well, I think this is a team that's kind of like in a weird place right now because this is a team that last, not this past season, but the year prior, 2021, they won 100 plus games. They overperformed expectations. They got career seasons from so many different players in their lineup. And then this past year, regress to the mean, 500 team, still talented, but maybe not as good of a season as we thought entering the year in 2022. And that is the San Francisco Giants, who I just am totally confused about this team. They had so many veterans overperform expectations in 2021. They lost the Buster Poses of the world. They lost the Chris Bryant's of the world to free agency, you brought back the Logan Webbs. You signed the Carlos Rodon, so one of your deals. And now it's like, where are you going from here? Are you letting Rodon walk in free agency? Are you going to sign Aaron Judge and try to be an all-in playoff contender? Like, I'm just confused with this Giants team as a whole. Do they want to be good or do they want to just kind of sit on their hands and just kind of keep building this thing slowly? I don't know what they want to do with signing Aaron Judge, but letting Carlos Rodon walk would just be mixed messages. So I just want the Giants to get on one clear page and send it to their fan base. We're all in. We're re-signing Rodon. We're bringing in Aaron Judge and we're trying to win the World Series or don't do anything and start to blow this thing up and start to retool because I don't feel like they have a lot of young talent coming up through that system. I feel like they could do a little retooling in that front office for the line. I, you and I have said this before. I don't think they were a 107-win team a couple of years ago, and I do not believe they were an 81 team this year. I think they're a low 90-win team mm. uh, where the balls all dropped in the right place in 2021, and they did it this year. I think that they're right in between. Uh, I think that signing Judge would be a huge splash uh, in some ways, literally, if he's hitting those balls to right field. I think they need to have that message sent to the fan base that, hey, hey, last year was the fluke, not the 107-win season. We're going to go for it. We're going to try to knock the Dodgers when they're vulnerable. And speak of the devil, the Dodgers – are in a very strange situation because year in and year out, they're going to win 100 games. They're going to win 100 games again. And they are. this is probably the swan song for Clayton Kershaw, uh, one of the great, if not the greatest, Los Angeles Dodger of all time, just in terms of a complete body of work. Um, Obviously, Sandy Koufax is going to be looked upon as the greatest L.A. Dodger, but Koufax's peak was was, was very short. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the Dodgers, they won the World Series in 2020. They want to have a World Series title that doesn't have the COVID stink on it to, to remove them from any comparison to the Bobby Cox Braves. Again, there's no dishonor being compared to a team that had one of the great runs of all time. But th- that being said, this team really needs a second title. And I'm still stunned that they lost to San Diego. I'm absolutely flummoxed that they lost to San Diego. Uh, but then again, I was flummoxed they lost to Washington in 2019. This is a team that, you know, Will Smith, the catcher for LA, hit a drive to right center field in the fifth game of the division series between Los Angeles and Washington that almost dropped in. And if it dropped in, they would have advanced. No one would have remembered the Washington Nationals. And chances are they clobber the Cardinals, and we have a rematch with Houston. But that didn't happen. And now you're seeing Trey Turner could leave. uh, Justin Turner could leave. You know, there's all sorts of rumors that they want to bring in this great player, that great player. Uh, But they're going to have a lot of money come off the books, Now, San Francisco has a lot of money off of their books as well, which is one of the reasons why those two teams could be potentially scary in the offseason. But they have to stick the landing. They can't go into an offseason where there are a ton of superstars and some of their prime available to be snatched up or re-signed in the case of Trey Turner and let them walk when they have the financial flexibility to do it. So I think those two great rivals – Los Angeles and San Francisco have to really make sure that when this, when the dust settles of this off season, 
that they've made a big splash to show their fans they're going for it, but also, you know, to help with ticket sales. Yeah, and for the Dodgers, like, I'm always confident that they could do something in season near the trade deadline, go get your Max Scherzers and Trey Turners in one package deal. They're probably going to have some random prospect come up from the minor league system and be a superstar for them. Like, the Dodgers can always find these random talents out of nowhere. For the Giants, I think it's going to be a little tougher for them because if they don't come away with a good offseason, there's a real chance next season at the end of the year you look at the standings and you're saying, wow, Giants, fourth place team in the NOS behind the Dodgers the Padres, and the Arizona Diamondbacks. Sully, let me give you another team on my list uh, real quick because um, I think there's a bunch of teams. Honestly, I think you could just kind of go through the whole AL East and kind of make a case for a bunch of these teams. Like I'm specifically looking at like the Blue Jays and Baltimore Orioles because mm-hmm. the Blue Jays came into last offseason as like everyone's like offseason darling. Everyone thought they were going to win the World Series. You looked at that lineup with the Bichettes, the Tioscars, the Springers, the Vlads. You looked at the rotation stack too. I remember you thought Jose Barrios was going to be the Cy Young Award winner. That might have been the worst miss of the season. We won't even talk about it, nope. but yeah, we will just. No, I'll, I'll admit it. I, I whiffed on that pick. That <laughs> but, but, but did you pick Furlander? Let me see. Did you write down Furlander? I have, to, I have to go back and see who I might have picked that year. But Blue Jays, I think, are under a lot of pressure, especially after trading Tiasco Hernandez, which is just a deal I really don't understand. Like, it's so easy to get an MLB All Star. You just trade them a bag of peanuts and say this 16 year old prospect from Cuba is going to be a superstar in 10 years, and then boom, you got an All Star on your team. Like, it's really crazy how MLB will be deals happen so for the blue jays i think there's a ton of pressure considering the expectations that they had last year they fired their manager weird season for them so i think the blue jays are under a lot of pressure and also the baltimore orioles who were winning all these games last year then the trade deadline came around they said hey let's just move off some of our better players because we're not even ready to win right now what kind of message does that send to your fan base we're trading away players in the midst of a playoff run you don't want to send that message to your fan base and players on your team so i think they need to make moves to show that their fan to show that they're to their fans and to their players like we're serious about winning we're not just going to try to rebuild and tank every year because where does that get you as a as a franchise as a whole so i hope they go out there this offseason this offseason actually make moves to try to win games and build toward the playoff race well that's the reason why i picked the baltimore Orioles to be the team to sign carlos correa Mm -hmm. that i think that they will i think they're going to make a splash i think there's some major free agents out there and I think they are going to – and it's not about we're going to sign a couple of pretty they, pretty good players. They need to get a marquee signing to send the message to their fans that, hey, we're, we're, we're going to go for it. Because you saw – Baltimore can be a great baseball city. You saw when they were starting yeah. to win. They were, they were showing up. They and, were in Baltimore. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, another factor I wanted to bring up about um, Toronto is obviously they made a ton of moves – in the previous year to sort of push their chips to the center of the table and to win what they thought was going to be a winnable division. And the way they lost the postseason, getting shut out in game one and then blowing that huge lead to Seattle and being humiliated at home in that, that the game where they were up like what, seven to one, eight to one, something crazy like that. And they wound up losing that game, uh, an elimination game at home to the Mariners, uh, I thought that was going to cost the, the the manager's job. Uh, you know, who's in or manager anyway, Schneider, and and I was stunned that he was able to keep his job. Uh, but when you have a when you have huge expectations and your your postseason ends on such a grotesque note, that there there has to be a mission from that front office for the fans to say, uh, okay. Uh, we're sorry. <laughs> Our bad. Um, you, you, the Yankees are in a very strange position right now. Um, they Everything went right the first half of the season. And it looked like the people were saying, oh, they, this is going to be a 110-win team. Like the Giants in 2021, I never believed this was a 110-win team. They want to be a 99-win team, uh, appropriately for a year with Aaron Judge, number 99. Um, but Yankee fans are tired of making the playoffs and then walking away. There is, there is a stigma to the Hal Steinbrenner era, which is he seems to be fine with it. The Yankees draw very well. 
They have very good television ratings. You know, the, the stands are, are, are you know, they get very good crowds. They sell a lot of, you know, foam we're number one fingers and, and, and ice cream cups and helmets. They get a lot of revenue from their TV stream because they own the network. So if from a business point of view, what, there's no problem. There's no problem. Since the last time the Yankees have appeared in the World Series, half the teams in baseball have also appeared in the World Series and not the Yankees. And so they said that the bottom half of recent pennant winners, when you stop and think about it, Yankee fans are tired of that. And they're tired of being sold, hey, we're contending and it's a crapshoot. Um, you know, and, and, but then you see terrible roster construction from Brian Cashman. I could do a whole series of podcasts about why I find it absolutely bewildering that Cashman still has this job. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and not that I think Cashman's in common. He's been in there too long. You need to shake the edge of sketch every once in a while. You need to bring some new blood because this, you know, their analytics, is, they're not cutting it. The roster construction is terrible. And then Aaron Boone, I mean, is he a good manager or not? I don't know. He's told, He does what he's told. And I think Yankee fans are tired of it. You hear it all the time. They're tired. They're not satisfied. I think in 2017, when they were probably a year ahead of schedule and got to the League Championship Series, I think they were fine with that year because they thought, all right, all right, we're, we're, we, they beat an Indians team, and they were the Indians then. They beat an Indians team that everyone in their cow thought was going to win the pennant, uh, and then they wound up losing to an Astros team that was cheating. Okay, and so now they have a window of opportunity to, you know, to try to, you know, win, and we're now well into the second straight decade without a Yankee pennant. And I think that, Yankee fan. I mean, think about the rule of seven here. You know the rule of seven, where you're about the rule of seven is my theory, and I talk about it at the podcast at nauseum. That is, you start to have your major uh, sports memories when you're around seven years old, mm. and so with that in mind. Like, you know, like if you're, you don't remember a lot of stuff when you're three, four, five years old of a baseball team. But when you're on seven, that's usually when your first memories of a team. So if you're a Yankee fan who's younger than 20 years old, you don't really have a memory of your team in the World Series. No. And for a, that's basically a new generation of Yankee fans who – Say, you know, we keep hearing about our team going to the World Series, 27 rings. Not in my lifetime, not in my memory. And I, it's getting stale. And the Yankees first went to a World Series in 1921. 101 years ago, they went to their first World Series. Since then, only one manager has managed the team five straight years without winning a pennant. And that man is Aaron Boone. Oh, wow. Look at the fun fact there, Sully. And, you know, the low, you know Showalter managed him for four years when he was let go. Uh, and that has a caveat because in the 94 team was probably going to win the pennant uh, when the strike hit. But every other time, you know, whether it's the Stump Merrills of the world or the, the you know, Bucky Dents or the Lou Pinellas or who might Bill Vernon all go down up and down the Yankee roster. If you don't want to pen it in three or four years, buy kick, you know, kick rocks, hit the bricks, you're done. And Aaron Boone still has his job. And I think that Yankee fans are a little tired of a front office that says, what's the problem? This is, yeah. we're, we're fine with this. We're fine yeah. with this. Yeah. For the Yankees. I mean, this is such a weird point. I think they're the obvious answer to the question, which team is under the most pressure this offseason? I just felt like we've talked about the Yankees so much. Maybe we just want to avoid them as an easy answer because for this Yankees team, this is quite literally maybe the biggest point in Yankees franchise history over the last decade over the last 20 years because what happens this offseason can set up the next 10 to 20 years for the Yankees franchise for the Yankees lore for the Yankees institutions because I don't know 
what the Yankees stand on anymore. They used to be the bad boys who went out there in free agency and spent money and got the top players. I used to look at those Yankees lineups from the early 2000s where it was like six, seven, eight players deep. You had your main rotation starter with two or three guys behind him that you felt confident in. You had the Mariano Rivera's closing at the back end of the bullpen. You had stars at every other position around the diamond in your rotation in the bullpen for this Yankees team. You weren't ever worried about your best homegrown player leaving unless his name was Robinson Cano. So for this Yankees team, it's like, If Aaron Judge leaves the Yankees franchise, where do the Yankees go from here? How can they look their fan base in the faces and say, we're trying to get back to the World Series by letting a historic player like Aaron Judge walk? How can you keep bringing back Aaron Boone? How can you keep bringing back Brian Cashman if a player like Aaron Judge walks? So this offseason is huge because this is like a hot seat offseason for the GM. Usually you see these kind of hot seat transactions happen during the season after the offseason with you, you know, once you see how the team plays. But if Brian Cashman can't close a deal on Aaron Judge this offseason, that might be the straw that breaks the camel's back as to whether Brian Cashman should even build the team for 2023. I see that the here's the deal, and this is where our Yankee fans will probably kick in. If he loses Aaron Judge, um Cashman still is gonna have his job. I don't think anything, I don't think anything will prevent Cashman from keeping his job. And yet the one time since 2000, the one time in the last 22 years that the Yankees have won the World Series, they did so after opening up their wallet, bringing in Sabathia, bringing in Tisher, bringing in Burnett, and making sure that the Jeters and Riveras and everyone didn't walk. And they just refused to do that. By the way, I want to bring the last team, and I have mentioned this team a few times, but um, the Guardians mm. need to bring a batter to in. Uh, I had Bryce Patter come here yesterday talking about why I think um, Gallo should return to the Rangers because he has so much positive, you know, he has so much good blood and 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 good uh, uh, will in the bank in Texas. And he, in order, the last time Gallo was an All Star, you have to go all the way back to 2021 uh, with the Rangers. You know, come back and you know the and. For a cheap contract, you can bring him back to where he belongs, which is Texas. Um, but he could be an interesting fit in Cleveland, mm. especially because he's inexpensive. Peterson is an inexpensive signing. A professional hitter like J.D. Martinez, if you're trying to get someone to be just a solid bat in the middle of that lineup with that great pitching staff and all that young talent, imagine just plugging in J.D. Martinez. And look at, we're not asking you to be a superstar. We're asking you to be almost like a, a second uh, uh, you know, hitting coach to be here. Here's how we're going to be professional hitters in the middle of that lineup. You have a guy who you know, was an all-star this year, J.D. Martinez, you know, he's not the home run hitter, but he hit those doubles into the gap and were all those players, you know, those, those jackrabbits on Cleveland's roster to have a guy hitting doubles into the gap might mean an extra run here or there, which might be the difference between winning and losing a game with that tremendous pitching staff and that unbeatable bullpen that they have in Cleveland. Uh, I think that it's, uh, you know, quite frankly, the window, yeah, you know, we looked at, we talked about the Astros understanding that the window of opportunity is right now. Cleveland has to know their window of opportunity is right freaking now. With a super young team, you add a, a, a veteran with playoff savvy veteran like JD Martinez, whose baseball IQ is off the charts. You plug him right into that lineup. Next thing you know, you have a couple extra hits, a couple extra wins, and maybe another division title, and maybe you roll the dice. Yeah, I think. The offseason is so important for the Cleveland Guardians is because of that division factor. You can basically mm-hmm. shut down that division over the next few years with a good offseason because you just look at it right now. Like the White Sox just lost their guy, Jose Abreu, like we talked about at the beginning of the podcast. Like they're severely going to be drained with talent potentially after this offseason. The Minnesota Twins, like they were a fun story for most of the year last year, but they all of a sudden after this offseason, like lose a Carlos Correa, like that's not going to all of a sudden help them become better after this offseason the tigers they spent a whole bunch of money last offseason but they seem like a disaster they had like one of the worst one of the worst offensive seasons ever by like an mlb team so the division is there for the taking for the guardians where it could be a parade to the playoffs the next five years and if they could build a good team 
through the offseason, through trades. I like the J.D. Martinez move, you know, idea maybe more than the Joey Gallo, just not a big Joey Gallo guy. But just your overall point of bringing big boys into that building, veterans who know what they're doing at the plate, guys who could draw out, you know, long at bats like a J.D. Martinez. And he's one of those guys that, you know, when he gets in the lab, he brings others along with him and he rubs off on younger players. Him and Mookie Betts used to sit for hours on the bench and just go over game tape. So I think a guy like J.D. Martinez bringing him in the building would be huge for that young roster. Well, think about that when he had his cameo with Arizona. He was with the Diamondbacks for, what, two and a half months? Oh, but in that, two and a half months ever. But, but think of how he affected that offense in, for that team. And that, you know, then he carried them right to the division series that year. I mean, he was, that was just a phenomenal addition. You saw how he rubbed off on the other hitter. I mean, you, you obviously saw it with a, you know, front row seat. So, and, and he's not going to take a long, it's not going to cost a long-term deal or anything like that to bring. And that's why I've brought up these players who were recent all-stars like Martinez, like, um, you know, uh, Peterson, like Joey Gallo, who, are players who are potential rebounds, potential comeback player of the years who may just need a change of scenery and bounce back. Well, there you go. There you, there you go. go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, this is a, the, those these are these are teams that need to make that big uh, you know, need to make that big splash. Yeah, and honestly, you could make a case for, like, the whole AL East. I mean, the Red Sox, they need, like, something good to happen this offseason. Like, they're another team. I don't know what they're doing. Tampa Bay Rays, they're just another one of those teams that go out there, win 95 games, get to the playoffs, and just kind of flame out every year in the postseason. So it would be kind of nice if they went out there and got, like, some real star potential. Like, why couldn't they go out there and get, like, a Jose Abreu? would have been, like, a perfect Tampa Bay Ray, maybe because of the money. But I think the whole AL East, it's just, like, offseason uh uh, chopping block time for figuring out what they need to be next year. Well, I know what you need to be every day is be listening to Locked On Diamondbacks or Locked On MLB. And by the way, thanks so much for making Locked On MLB your first listen today. For your second listen, obviously Locked On Diamondbacks. Third listen, check out Locked On Sports today for the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports. Go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports today is available on this app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. And speaking of getting your podcasts, Miller Thomas, tell people where they're going to listen to your terrific show. Yeah, you can follow me on all streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Music. Follow us on YouTube, Locked on Dimebacks on there as well. So please hit subscribe. Follow us on all your uh, social media platforms, Twitter, at Creator Thomas 24 for my personal account, or look up Locked on Dimebacks on both Twitter and Instagram. And you can follow us at Lockdown MLB Pods on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm your pal Sally with Sally Baseball on Twitter, Sally Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Talking about those teams that need to kill it and follow the lead of the Astros who are saying, we're not going to wait. We're going to improve our team right now. This has been a Lockdown MLB, Lockdown Dynamics crossover. He's Miller Thomas. I'm your pal Sally. It's time for us to fist bump. See you next week.